my name is Gaurav Basin and I am the client executive at Trisco and I am also the lead for the FIMS AME project as well. So today's agenda is going to be covering uh, essentially general information about FIMS, like what is FIMS, uh, how, what's the practical use case of FIMS as well. Uh, but we won't get into very great detail, just at a, at a higher level. We will also be talking about what is FIMS AME because the service currently right now as it stands, there are vendors that are currently in the process of developing products for AME, but they, they are still not mature enough to essentially be able to be leveraged within media organizations, but it is coming. So it's essentially planning for the future and something that the business board in FIMS has asked for. We'll also be covering uh, what the status is for the FIMS AME service as well. And then what are the next steps? So let's start, start from the top. So the FIMS group. The FIMS group is divided at the higher level into two separate areas. One is the admin board, which is primarily made up of media organizations. Um, there's a large number of them, and you can uh, refer to all the different organizations that are part of the FIMS admin board on the, on the EBU website as well as well as the AMWA, AMWA or in general the FIMS website. There's also um, the admin board, and the admin board is comprised of both vendors and media organizations. Now the admin board's directive is to essentially do research on um, how to basically meet the needs of what it is that the business board needs. So within the underneath the admin and the business board, we have the FIMS technical board. So there's various subgroups that are currently leading efforts to develop uh, various services. So the, there's the architectural council, and this council is essentially responsible for ensuring that all the different services that are being developed adhere to the standards of FIMS. There's the FIMS repository, there's the FIMS QA, FIMS time code, and FIMS AME. So each one of those different subgroups right now has their own leads as well. So FIMS, the definition, uh, so what, what, what is FIMS and why do, what, where does the benefit really lie over here? So what we have is the vision. The vision really is pretty simple. You want to basically be able to adapt new vendors into an ecosystem that may exist at a relatively low cost and be able to scale and deliver uh, with the rapid growing, you know, um, state of the industry today. And the concept is really driving from the, the fact that if you have interoperable services between the, the various workflows that you have within the media organizations, you will be able to essentially be able to replace components, add new components, and be able to scale. And an example of that could be just uh, think of it like as language. So if you have an ingest workflow that was happening and you have to give it to somebody who speaks French and then you have to convert it over to somebody that speaks um, English and then give it to someone who speaks Spanish and then Italian and then get it through a workflow, it just makes it very difficult to, to do. So by having a standard layer in between for communication between the various components that you have within a, 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 a workflow, it solves the, the challenge that you currently have of everything speaking a different language and is very customized. So, and, and, and also, you know, with the, the various challenges that you have with the media organizations today, you want to be able to keep in uh, par with your competition as well and be able to meet the needs of new devices as they come along. Just because we have mobile devices today, tomorrow there could be something else, a new format, higher quality, higher bit rate, and, and you might need to be able to adapt to different vendors to, uh, to your existing workforce. So the approach that's uh, essentially being taken over here is SOA, which is Service Oriented Architecture. So everything within um, the various services that have been developed is treated as FIMS services. So it's not, it's, um, it doesn't matter if it's transcoder A from company A, if it's transcoder B from company B, it is a transcoder. So that is an essential concept that you have over here within FIMS, which is fundamental. And to be able to really not treat vendors as tightly coupled um, systems to your existing infrastructure, but rather loosely coupled 
and we can achieve that with SOA architecture. And uh, we, we do expose the various services that have been developed within FIMS as both SOAP as well as REST. Again, that just uh, depends on what the needs are of the, you know, the, the particular client that might be wanting to implement it. If you have REST uh, you know, interface that you can adapt, sure, you can do that, or SOAP works equally as well as, as, uh, as REST. Um, and then there's also a pattern that has also developed. So in the beginning, there was, we had the capture, then we went to the FIMS transfer service, then we went to the transform service. But the, the natural evolution was there because at the root of everything, there was uh, the concept of, and this is going to lead into the next slide, of the FIMS DMO. That is really at the heart of uh, FIMS, and that's where everything begins and everything kind of wants to end, but, but that's at the root. So it's essentially being able to describe a, a file as an object and not just something which sits on a file system somewhere or a tape somewhere. It really does have a life and an existence as well. So, you know, you might capture uh, a file into your system, and then there's metadata that you want to be able to describe on the asset itself. So what kind of information does this object have? It has the media container, which is the structure of the media. <laughs> it has descriptive metadata, which is based on the EBU core. And as the EBU core grows, we are going to be adapting to the additional elements that are going to be added into the EBU core as well. There's the technical metadata, which sounds very complicated, but uh, I mean, technical metadata really is referring to uh, you know, what kind of codec is there, what type of extension is on the file, and then you also have the reference to the media itself, which is the physical location. So we're not looking at media any anymore as just being, as I said before, a physical file that just lies somewhere. It does have more meaning to it. And uh, the technical metadata is also application-specific metadata supported via extension elements. Sure. So when you say media, what exactly do you mean? Is it media tape or something, or is media in general? In, in, in this particular case over here, your media could be a physical file that sits on a file system, which you could have captured, or it could be a tape file that exists. So a media could be an interview of President Obama at his inauguration. Correct. So in, in this particular structure over here, you would store the title of the video. You would represent that video by different flavors because you no longer just have one piece of file which represents the video. You know, when you ingest it, you might create a proxy off that video as well. You might want to generate a thumbnail off of it or maybe want to conform it to a standard format within your organization. And if you were to do so, you now have one media object, which is President Obama speaking, but it's represented by more than one physical file, and each file has its own uh, technical metadata, right? So the proxies and MP4, uh, different codec versus the H.264 for the MXF, etc. Uh, so here's an example of a sample FIMS asset. And within here, this is just representing the previous slide and, and maybe a little bit more example of, uh, of, of something. So within an organization, you can have a unique identifier for the media as well because you want to be able to refer to a video later on to be able to find it but have a unique ID given to it. You could have a title, description, creator, genre, created. So this is all with VM content. Then you have the content format that I was referring to before, the mime type the codec, the bit rate, and then you have the actual location as far as what storage, because you could even have an MXF file, for example, sitting within a repository, but it could be sitting in multiple repositories as well. It could be on Neuroline, it could be in a uh, you know, pr production playout server somewhere, it could be on the cloud. So the same file could also exist in multiple locations. With, within this object itself, you now capture everything about that you need to know to be able to drive workflows and to be able to really have uh, information about the asset. If I'm asking too many questions, you just No, no, no worries. This is what I want. And my questions will be stupid. So no, no, <laughs> no questions ever stupid. So we jump from media to asset. So now, can you kind of maybe, what is an asset? Was it media in this case? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm using it interchangeably over here. So it is one and the same. Okay. So, um, you know, an asset, uh, 
in, in, in the way that I'm describing it, just use it interchangeably. So within the... So no, uh, it's all good, you know. So you say that you can have, you can have ID of the asset. Sure. But I assume that you know films should actually mandate some of those IDs or whatever you know sure. descriptors you get. Sure. Is that true? Well, is there a mandated set? Let's say. Of there, there are general set of, uh, guidelines that have been provided, and within the repository itself, uh, the films repository. Again, that's that's a different subject, but I'll I'll touch upon that for a minute. There is a concept of generating a unique ID before you do. Uh, you know, and add content within the repository itself. Now, it's up to the implementation of the vendor to determine what it is that needs to represent that ID value as, right? You see, the problem is that if you give that freedom, then the question becomes how my transformation engine or, you know, some other engine, some other subsystem talks to me if they don't know what I can, what kind of, you know, descriptors I can. Well, in, in this particular case, and, and in the next slide, I'll show you a workflow, and maybe let's go through that one. Uh, maybe it'll go through a chain of uh, what, what you're describing over here. But the general concept to note is that FINS also does support the concept of extension properties as well. And, um, you know, and, and everything I'm talking about is not just from a conceptual level, because there has been a need for one of the clients that we've essentially implemented FIMS at, where we've leveraged every part of the BMO that you could think about. We've had to put extension properties in because, you know, you want to be able to describe one particular uh, essence which exists inside of BMO to basically represent it as the mezzanine. So you could have three physical files, as I've referred before, the HDMXF, the MP4 proxy, and you could have, uh, I don't know, a smooth stream file that could be lying over there as well. And one of them you want to represent as the mezzanine, and that might have a business impact on the workflow uh, within your organization itself. So we've had to leverage this particular extension over here. And, and maybe, you know, depending on the storage that you store the file into, you might want to be able to track. Is it a fast access storage as well? Because depending on the type of workflow that you're executing, if your destination can wait for delivery, you might want to basically save some cost by going to a different storage, perhaps archive, rather than using the nearline storage uh, for accessing the files as well. So again, it, it gives you extensions at every level within. So descriptive metadata at the content format, as well as the essence itself. Right? So. Let's look at the FIMS interfaces that exist in FIMS 1.1 today. So here is an example of when you get um, content that's being encoded within FIMS. So again, you would have some a BMO that would essentially have some metadata that would be stored while the capture is taking place. You would then store that content within a repository. So there's a basic set of guidelines is that when you retrieve the BMO that comes out of the encoding that happened, then you would basically call the repository and, and follow a step of guidelines that have been provided both uh, from videos as well within the FIMS repository to basically allow the users to be able to generate a unique ID that we're referring to as well. So all that information could be stored. That same BMO is now being passed within the transfer content, but imagine that if you have an orchestration system, you might not want to do that because you, you don't want to pass the BMO that you stored within the repository into a transfer because you could have three essences that are inside your BMO. You just want to transcode one. You want to take the MXF. So in that particular instance over here, what you would have is an orchestration system would be sitting uh, below this and would be filtering possibly the BMO and passing that into the transfer service. The output of that could then again be transcoded, transferred, and distributed. The distribution could also be considered a repository as well, as it, is, it could be a CDN. But again, every step of the way, it might not be the same exact BMO that was um, at the inception. You might have to do some manipulation because for content delivery, you might want to basically use a subset of the essences that are within the BMO itself, right? So here are the FIMS interfaces that sit on each one of the different services that we've uh, described 
the floor over here, starting from uh, the, the encoding to the storing to the transfer, 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 and distribution. And as I mentioned before, there is a SOAP and a REST implementation for each one of those services. So you can also get the latest version of FIMS by downloading the link, and this presentation will be made available, on, I'm sure, as well on the FIMS website, so you can download so you don't have to memorize this whole URL. Well, I'll memorize what, what I do now. <laughs> then you go into what's included and watch the videos. Very important. Luik <laughs> uh, has done a great job in providing a lot of guidelines, especially for the repository as well. So you can, uh, as I said before, you can download the WSDLs, take the SOAP, take the REST. There are examples for each one of the services as well. So now that we've given a basic overview of what is FIMS and a, and a general introduction over here, the next thing that we're really going to get into is this, this AME. So AME, FIMS AME overview. I mean, it's it's kind of like a puzzle that we're trying to put together within FIMS, right? So there's building blocks, if, if you may, uh, such as the QA project being the building block, the service capabilities, the rest mapping, time code. AME is just one piece of the puzzle, but it's not the end. It, I'm sure there's going to be multiple services that can also come about in the future that we will be uh, developing as time goes on. So what is FIMS Automated Metadata Extraction? I mean, it sounds very complicated. It's, it's a big word, much larger than transfer and transcode. So what 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 uh, it's also referred to as AMI. So what it really is is it provides an interface supporting automated, semantic, and technical metadata extraction from audiovisual content and related existing uh, I'm sorry, exiting metadata. So what that is is you could have a, a vendor that could in the future or they could have it in the present where they could inspect a video, for example, and be able to automatically derive the text be able to describe, let's say, um, a person that could be in, within the video itself, and you could automatically derive that metadata and represent that within the BMO. So the structure, as I was referring to before, is already there. The BMO already exists. So AME just has to be a different implementation that a vendor could do to populate the BMO. There could be additional requirements uh, for AME itself that might need to represent that BMO slightly different because the transcode BMO coming back just cares about the essence location of the transported file and where it was on the input. And there could be some additional title, descriptions, certain metadata, versus an AME service needs to return back a, a fully hydrated AME um, BMO object, which can then later on be passed into, let's say, a repository, because you might want to basically be able to index and be able to search off of that information as well. So, there's, there's a need to basically standardize the AME, uh, and some of the things that have came about from the AME service itself have been things such as scene, face, context, detection, format properties, post caption, speech to text. So if you ran, for example, media info off of a file, that was the, the format information that I was referring to before, that could be considered as part of AME as well, because you just gather the technical metadata. But scene detection, speech to text are different. They're not technical metadata. Those are just descriptive metadata or derived metadata that you can have that need to be, again, defined well within the BML. And we are working with uh, the EVU Sky Group, which has an initiative that they're working, coincidentally, at the time that the FIMS AME initiative happened, on doing an evalu evaluation of AME vendors and uh, basically writing a proposal for media organizations to be able to to use companies that are developing this. So here's an example of AME. So in a video, you could have from time code one to time code two, person A, a face was detected playing football. Um, sorry, football, American, European soccer, same thing. And then you have football. <laughs> To, and then you could at the same time have, uh, now you can also have T2A where it's a different time code where you can basically say it's it's a video, but it's a shot of Ronaldo. So now just um, facial recognition, picking a football. Then I could say from time code 3 to time code 4, the ball was in position X, which is temporal and spatial uh, recognition as well. And then finally, you could have time code one to time code four, audio, English is being spoken, and it's temporal. So 
as, as you can see, there's so much power in terms of being able to extract this metadata. If you can index it, you can monetize all this information as well. So there's a there's a huge potential uh, so for this. If I understand correctly, it's some kind of artificial intelligence programming actually to process video to extract that it's from that. Sure, that's the secret sauce that would be a vendor that would do it. What what our responsibility in terms of the Fins AMA group is to be able to represent that data standard along the way for all vendors to be able to implement it so that a client doesn't have to worry about, okay, now I'm calling vendor A and I'm going to get back this metadata, but you know what, now it's not working too well for me, now I have to switch, well, guess what I have to do, I have to rewrite everything. No, it should just be, here is an interface, now whatever is the best breed of product for a client, you should be able to use it. So it's essentially trying to standardize it, but the, the point that you made earlier in terms of um, are there stringent guidelines that are also stringent restrictions that are in place? No, because you could have vendor A that could want to represent something slightly different than vendor B, but you want to give that flexibility, so you give them guidelines instead. It's not just, it's not something we're selling fits. It's something that a vendor is supposed to use because it will really make both a client and a vendor's life much easier. So now, I, I am a smart guy, I wrote a program you know, to extract that AME, sure. and I'm putting all this information in most like the mezzanine features, mezzanine objects. Okay. Uh, somewhere within the BMO, let's say Some, it'll be somewhere in there. Somewhere. Sure. So now, since I've been a poor implementer of those things, sure. suddenly you know, you're saying, I want to search them. Sure. So if you want to search, I'm thinking database, I'm thinking something on those sure. lines. Can you kind of explain a little bit how this thing's supposed to work? So okay, so again, what, what I was mentioning before was that we're providing a structure in which you could store automated metadata extraction information. Once that information has been extracted, um, I'll, I'll make two points. One is that they, we are currently working on test, which will come in the future as well, being able to basically provide a way for being able to validate the implementation of the FIM service to see whether or not certain guidelines have been met or not, right? So the second part of it is, is really to be able to, um, to be able to cast that information into a repository service, right? Because that, that information extracted from an AME service has done its job now. Once you store that within the repository, that information could then be indexed within the repository, and that's where the leverage could really be done of that information. But again, if we standardize it in such a way that now a repository can also do that, that information storage, then uh, you can search and be basically leverage that information a lot, a lot better. I'll, I'll wait you know, until Luke explains sure. all those details. No problem. <laughs> so FIMS Automated Metadata Extraction Group Information. So the group is composed of 30 members. It was kicked off in 2014. And I, I covered some of these things as well, but we're also leveraging a lot of the work that was done by the FIMS QA group and the time code group as well. So automated metadata extraction, there were certain guidelines that we needed to follow when we're doing this uh, this effort, which is AME metadata is temporal and or spatial, so you need to be able to track the projectile of a ball, for example, or when it's being kicked within a game. But you also need to be able to track temporal information as well, so from time code one to time code two, something happened. Um, we must allow metadata extraction on media asset parts as well, so you might want to inspect only certain parts of the media object as well. And model the FIMS AME service using the, the FIMS model. We did want to get out of the BMO and create something totally outside of this because, because again, you lose that commonality that exists by leveraging the concept. So the status, where we stand today, we have reviewed the FIMS QC service. Uh, we have left off the ACR, so again, the capability repository, Louis will cover that in tomorrow's demonstration as well of FIMS. Uh, he'll touch upon that, so I'll leave that for the time being. There's the, the AME request and the AME response. So every service that you have with FIMS follows the same model. If you're going to make a request to a service, you're going to get a response back from the service. But the response you get back from each service is going to be obviously slightly different. But we have to still follow the same, same general guidelines. So uh, the status continued over here. We are also working, as I mentioned before, with the EBU Sky Group. And the QA group, uh, what, what they did over there was they leveraged the EBU QC parts that were created by the EBU to essentially give a standard set of guidelines 
for what is QC, you know, noise level, uh, black frames, etc. So a set of cards were created so that when a vendor were to implement it, at least they have uh, something to refer to as far as what kind of validation they're going to be doing and what kind of information they should be returning back. So that same kind of effort will be done for AME as well, and Sky Group is going to be, lever uh, we're going to be leveraging the work that's going to be done by the FIM Sky Group to define what the cards are going to be for AME as well. Phase detection, scene detection, etc. Here's a quick glance again of where we are. We've extracted the, from the business charter the set of features that we wanted to implement as far as the first iteration for AME. We want to identify, we've also identified the business user stories. We've extracted technical requirements. We've prioritized the work. We're currently in progress of defining the AME model and implementing a new model in the scheme as well. So again, as I referred to before, it, there's harmony in terms of the work that's being done by the QA group, Time Corp group, and we're, we're just fortunate to be able to leverage the work that they're doing and just build on top of that what we need. So we're not just reinventing the real issue. So here's a quick uh, look over here of, of a workflow where AME could be used. So you could have a production repository. You can extract a media one essence, for example, out of it. You can do a QC check on it. You can then transfer that somewhere. You can transport it. You can transfer it again somewhere else. You can then run AME on it and then store that BMO back within the repository itself, all while using the same BMO and communicating across all of these different services. So at any given time, I can switch out any one of these components, such as like a keyboard or a mouse, just one breaks or one doesn't work and I have something better, I can just plug that in and now I can leverage the, the, the power that I need to. So here's just a different example again of looking at it in a, in a, in a different contextual workflow over here. And here's where, again, AME could be used. But again, it's going to fit in the same exact way. You have a SOAP, you have a REST interface for AME, just as you do for every single other service that you have within the chain. So the next steps. The next steps are to finalize the response model, the ACR model, identify faults and exceptions, because every service, a transcode error that you might have is also going to be unique to the repository versus transform, etc. So AME, we have to do our own definition as far as what are faults and exceptions that could be interpreted by the clients. There is also the AME schema uh, that I was referring to to provide samples. So every service that we do, we can't just develop it and just say, all right, well, conceptually it sounds good, let's just throw it out there and let everyone figure it out. We have to generate samples, examples, and real life scenarios where we could show how it should be implemented within uh, an organization's ecosystem. And we also have great documentation that's provided for most of the services for developers. There's guidelines, as I mentioned before, and we need to continue to work with the EDU Sky Group and vendors as well to, to start incorporating them, to start leveraging the work that we're doing as far as the things that we uh, project itself. And the time code, this last part over here, has now been finalized. So the time code is important to be able to do AME on parts of the media itself. So now that that's been done, we can leverage that work for, for what we need to do. So we ran a little bit short on time, so I kind of uh, apologize if I went a little bit fast. But uh, I hope that this gave you a good sense of what AME is and how it could be beneficial for the FIMS uh, in terms of the entire ecosystem within the organization if we wanted to leverage FIMS concepts in general. Do you have any other questions?